When we think of what makes nations great, we think of inspiring leaders, sweeping rhetoric, governments that are all great virtues. But my next guest says, think again. Sometimes it's much less grand than that. Peter Zehan posits that what really matters is demography, geography, and topography, quite literally, the land itself. That's why major civilizations developed around navigable waterways, rivers. It's why the United States, with its extraordinary rivers and ports, has a unique advantage. But will that geopolitical luck last? Listen in on my recent conversation with Peter Zahn, the author of a terrific new book called The Accidental Superpower, The Next Generation of American Preeminence and the Coming Global Disorder. Peter, pleasure to have you on. Pleasure to be here. So the big point of your book is America is in an enviable position, and it was historically and will continue to be. But I, I want to touch on why uh, geography and demography and these structural factors really inform your analysis. So you start out by pointing out that America has one of the world's most enviable markets because of rivers. Explain that. Sure. It really comes down to a balance of transport. How easy is it to move things within your system versus beyond your system? Water transport costs about one-twelfth of what it costs to move things by land, and that's assuming that you already have the infrastructure in place. Once you add in the interstates, the railways, the ports, and everything, it's about a 50 to 1 advantage. And, and that's why you point out throughout history, civilizations and cities have always started on rivers or ports. Almost all of the successful ones, whether it's the French, the Chinese, the Japanese, or so on. But in modern times, the United States has over 17,000 miles of these waterways. That's more than everybody else put together. That's more than the rest of the world put together. Absolutely. By comparison, what is China and Germany? China and Germany are about 2,000. The entire Arab world, just over 100. And so you have these great uh, river systems that allow you to get goods out. And then talk about America's port advantage. Ports, it's a whole different scale. Because of the intercoastal waterway, in essence, half of American frontage is protected. There is a series of barrier islands that protect everything. And then you have all these indentations in Texas, which have more combined port potential, potential, not actual ports, potential, than all of East Asia. It's, the geography is absolutely sublime. There's nothing like it anywhere else. The three largest ports in the world are in America. The San Francisco Bay Area, Puget Sound, and Chesapeake Bay. Okay, so that's the, that's the uh, advantage in terms of transport. Um, you also point out that the United States has enormous advantages demographically going forward. It's the only rich country in the world that is not uh, aging uh, you know, fast in the way that Japan and even Germany are. Tell us about some of the surprising elements here, because what's also true is demography is not working to the advantage of many of the so-called developing countries. Absolutely. There is a problem throughout the developing world that has something that was experienced in the developed world a while ago. Urbanization rates have now increased so much, and that has generated growth, industrialization, urbanization. That is good for economic growth. But when you move people from the farm to the city, all of a sudden children are a luxury good. And that has happened so fast in so many places that the birth rate has collapsed. So places like Indonesia or like Brazil are now aging at three and four times the rate that they are in Western Europe. Wait, Brazil is aging at three times the rate of Western Europe? Absolutely. You look at Japan aging fast, Europe aging fast. The U.S. remains privileged. Um, but you point out it's, it's also going to be isolated, separated from the world. Uh, Explain how, how that works out, um, especially with regard to energy. Sure. I'm not sure if I would use the word isolated. Retrenched might be a slightly better word. But the United States is discovering that the global trade system is dependent upon it, but that the United States doesn't really use the trade system. Right now, it's about 90% of GDP is America's total involvement, which is less than some countries like Bolivia or Kyrgyzstan. Right. Right. We are now is something like 50. 50, 50, yeah. 50. Yeah. Where the United States is now the least involved international economy as percentage of GDP. And a lot of that is disappearing. It used to be that 5% of our GDP was imports of energy products. Well, because of shale, we've gone from importing about 12 million barrels today to two, once you figure out North America as a, as a chunk. Within two years, North America is going to be energy independent. What OPEC is doing with shale, the price war, is not really working because shale production costs are now below $50 a barrel. They're cost competitive. So the war is pushing out Russian Siberian crude or North Slope crude or Albertan or Algolan 